Hello, I'm Justin Briley. Welcome along to the third of four programmes in which we're asking, have we misread the Bible? My guests again today are Steve Chalk and Andrew Wilson. Steve Chalk is the founder of the Oasis Trust and pastor of Oasis Church in Waterloo. He's a well-known author, a leading voice in the British Christian Church, also sometimes uh, a somewhat controversial one. In recent decades, he's sparked intense debates on issues like homosexuality and the atonement. Uh, he's going to be in conversation today with Andrew Wilson. Uh, he's a speaker, author and theologian with New Frontiers Network. Um, he takes a, perhaps a more conservative, you could say, approach to scripture. Uh, we're going to be debating that. We've been debating that the last two shows. Uh, his own article on biblical interpretation comes the month after Steve. So Steve started this conversation by, uh, by writing an article for Christianity magazine. You can find it in their March edition called Have We Misread the Bible? Well, Andrew's follow-up article comes in the April edition. Together they're joining me to talk about whether we need to change the way we read scripture. And over the course of these four programmes, we've been discussing their different views on biblical inerrancy, the Old Testament, and that was last week. Next week, it'll be sexuality. Today, though, we're asking, how should we view the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins? Now, if you want to catch up with the articles or indeed any of the videos that we've produced, in this series, do go to the website christianitymagazine.co.uk slash Bible debate. Uh, so we're tackling a big issue today, guys. Uh, trying to fit each of these into a half an hour programme is always impossible, as we found last week when we could have gone on uh, for all day, probably, talking about the Old Testament. Uh, but today's question is around that whole aspect that, that you raised about 10 years ago, believe it or not, Steve, um, let's let's remind ourselves about that story. So 10 years ago, you created something of controversy. You called into question essentially the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. It was part of a book called The Lost Message of Christ, uh, The Lost Message of Jesus, I should say. And even though it was only a, a short segment of one chapter, mm. it caused an outcry. Um, you equated effectively the idea of God punishing Jesus in our place by, as it were, pouring out his wrath upon him as a form of cosmic child abuse. Uh, that was certainly the phrase that got uh, repeated time and again. It led to debates, papers, symposiums. Many people felt that you could no longer call yourself an evangelical because of rejecting this particular doctrine of penal substitution. Were you surprised at the reaction that had um, do you believe that the evangelical church has been misreading this particular issue? Um, I was surprised at the, the reaction I had because actually that book didn't deal with the theology of penal substitution at all. It was, um, I wouldn't say a throwaway phrase, but it was one or two sentences in a book. Um, I wrote it because it's what I believe and it's the way I think. And it's what the, a view that I've come to over the course of the years that I've been a pastor, a local church leader, working with people. So I wrote it down, and um, and then uh, you know all that kind everything of, exploded. So I yeah. then I then responded, and I did write theologically, if you like, about about that text. Um, so I was I was surprised about it. But you believed you were as it were, correcting a misrepresentation of the cross. Yeah, an, an, an ugly misrepresentation of the cross, in, in my view. Um, and again, you know, in all of these things, it's because I take the Bible seriously. I'm a follower of Jesus, you know. So I think about following Jesus and what the Bible means about following Jesus every day of my life. It just, just do. And I, mm. I think about that in the context of pastoring and caring for people who are both inside and outside the church and I I just felt I, I do feel that that ugly view as I understand it of the cross where a wrathful God has to get blood and um, once he's got blood he can forgive us we can be forgiven because God the wrath of God has been satisfied by by getting the blood of someone else Jesus I, I think that that misrepresents God and misrepresents the Trinity. And that's mm. what I said. Now, I do believe there are loads of ways of understanding the cross. Sure. Um, but, but you I don't, don't believe think that, 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 that fits. The penal substitution, as far as you're concerned, <coughs> is not affirmed by Scripture either, regardless of how you, you feel about it as a sort of as a doctrine. Uh, no, I don't think it's affirmed by Scripture. I think that there are individual texts 
that have been taken and used. And I think that's the that my bigger point. Sure. I think we need to read the Bible differently because people pull texts and use them and bang, you know, shout loud about them. But actually, I think that the idea of a wrathful God demanding the blood of his own son, Jesus, before being able to forgive us is has nothing to do with the character of God, as I find it explained in the Bible or dememonstrated through the life of Jesus. And, and indeed, all the facts of what yeah, happened and, on and the cross. And you've, you've come to this last yeah. week that, that yeah. it's, a, it's through Jesus that we have to interpret yeah. Scripture in its totality yeah. and so on. I mean, you're familiar with this debate as well, Andrew. But I, as I understand it, you're comfortable affirm the view of penal substitution yeah. and you believe it's there in scripture yeah i do um and i, I think probably there's two that's like, once again the exegesis hermeneutics thing um i think two different things happening uh, it, with with our different positions i think one of them would be exegetical decisions about what particular texts mean which you've alluded mm. to i think we might well read isaiah mm. 53 uh, just differently mm. i think i'd, I'd mm read it as, as affirming, certainly not the version of penal substitution that I think Steve was trying to take out. I, I agree with you, it's not a form of cosmic child abuse. I agree with you that it's not a, a you know, a kind of randomly sparky, wrathful, vengeant deity striking somebody else on behalf of people, because of course I believe the cross is self-giving and that God, because of the Trinity, I think, I, I, I think a lot of views of penal substitution, and certainly that bus, you know, the bus driver hits the kid thing. Mm. I mean, that's awful because it, it's not Trinitarian. It doesn't mm. express the self-giving nature of the cross. So there's a lot of versions of it I would reject and okay. uh, that Stephen too. Um, but I do believe that it is being taught in a, in a radically different form to, than that in a text like Isaiah 53. So there's an exegetical disagreement there. Um, but there's probably also a hermeneutical one, which is I think that we've sort of several times come up with it, against this over the last couple of, couple of sessions as well, that I think there are there, there, there are texts that in Steve's reading you, you can just look at that and it says, well, I know that the, the text sounds like it means that, but to be honest, it, it, we've got to marginalise that text or, or push it to the side in, in favour of a different view of God we formed mm. from some other texts. Mm. And I think that's... So there's probably those two things are going on. Okay. Rather than, I think if we agreed about Isaiah 53, mm. we might still disagree about... Isaiah 53 substitute. is the passage of the suffering servant yeah. and the yeah. fact that by his stripes yeah, we are healed, the, by his iniquities I think the and so the one. But even if we agreed on it, I'm saying I think we might still disagree about penal yeah. substitution because yeah. of our wider yeah. uh, interpretation yeah. issues. Yeah. I, I, and all I, yeah, I'm sure that's true, but um, um, all I'd say is I'm not trying to ever push away the text of the Bible. How I changed my view around penal substitution, because I grew up with it, mm. you know. How I actually changed it was years and years and years and years before. What happened was, the, the first job I had as a minister, as a church leader, was in Tunbridge in Kent, oh, the first paid one. I'd worked for churches for free as volunteer. <laughs> I eventually achieved getting paid. And a terrible, tragic uh, situation occurred. Um, uh, there was a, a girl who was in our youth group who was in a very, very serious car crash. And she was taken to the hospital in Tunbridge Wells, which since shut down. And I visited her, and she was fighting for life. And her parents came in, and they cried. And then, I think it was her dad who said, they were both Christians, they said, God, where are you? Where are you? Why, why aren't you here? Why aren't you here? He was, you know, hysterical. Mm. And as he spoke, it reminded me of what Jesus said on the cross. Mm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I'd always been taught, and it's in some of the songs, isn't it? The father turns his face away because he can't lick on Jesus who's sinful. And I'm thinking, but God is in this ward with this girl. And I realised then, for the first time, that I'd misunderstood Psalm 22, which is what Jesus is quoting. Jesus says, my God, my God, where are you? But he knows God is there and he knows God's not abandoning him. He knows the angry father can't turn his face away until that. He knows all of that, which is, of course, why he then goes on. But when people tell you all about the father turning his face away, which is in a very popular song by someone with a lovely tune, I just think it's lousy theology. Um, uh, but what they don't point out is that Jesus, who feels that God may have abandoned him. He's hanging on to the fact that God's there mm. in this crisis. He then says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, forgive them. These prayers come afterwards. 
So who's he praying to if he thinks God's not listening? He knows God's there. Okay. God's with him in his suffering. Why was Jesus dying on the cross? He was dying on the cross for the sins of the world, because of the sins of the world. He was dying on the cross because angry, evil, um, self-centered men protecting their own sure. world have put him there. But, but presumably you'd again be wary of false dichotomies, Andrew, at this point, in terms of... I would, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm with Steve on Psalm 22, and I'm probably be in trouble with some people watching for that. I, okay. I, I think Psalm 22 is a vindication psalm. I think the whole point of my God, my God, and Jesus quoting it is not, you're not supposed to stop at verse one. You're supposed to read the rest and see the parallels of people wagging their heads at him and people spitting at him and sure. dividing his clothing. And then at the end, there's this cry of, so, he has, he's done it. Yeah. God, has, so, God has done it. So, so rather I'm, disturbing you, for you, we <laughs> you, might you're be not far disagreeing. more agreed well, about well, this. Well, but, 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 I, I think back. probably, we, we both, I think there's a, there's a, I don't know whether it's, it's not a straw man, that's the problem, I wish it was. There's the, there's the, for me it's represented by the bus driver mowing down a kid mm. picture, which I've heard more just, times. Just kind of give us that, others, that right? illustration It's a go for those kind of gospel familiar, picture yeah. in which God, so how many, help me get it right, Steve. So yeah. We've probably both heard it. You've yeah. probably, we've I've probably used it. I've as well, but go on. So, the, so God's the bus driver uh -huh. and there's a narrow bridge mm. and there's a busload of people, which is us. Mm. And then he sees a little boy run out into the bridge. Right. So mm. he, and he has a choice. Does he mow down the little boy or does he drive the bus over the cliff? Mm. And so he decides to kill the boy, but it turns out the boy's his son. That's the picture. Okay, yeah, right. And it's terrible yeah. theology. It's awful theology because mm. if it, actually many of the reasons I agree entirely, I think really with, with a lot there's, of what Steve's saying. There's no choice on the part of the because, son. Because there's no choice the... on the part of the son. It's not self-giving. Mm. The son and the father are regarded as thoroughly separate beings. It's what happens when you have shoddy Trinitarian theology projected into an okay. image. The father turns his face away as a line. I don't mind it, but I don't think but I can argue true. it. I don't think I could argue okay. it from. I, I, from from, the I hear it as poetic, but the, I don't think you could argue Bible. it from the, Psalm 22. The theology that that's coming I, from. I, is I don't the think idea there's a text that proves no, that God as cannot as look upon. It's got a nice upon. tune, okay. and it sells people well, across let, let's, because but, God's not like But let's that. talk about yeah. the theology rather than yeah. uh, particular <laughs> the lines. Um, the the idea of to God, God <laughs> turning his face away because yeah. he cannot look upon sin yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Do you, do you say that you, you're not quite sure I, that that quite is part of what I don't see that in the, the Bible, no. I'm and mistaken. that's not necessarily part of, for you, uh, penal no, substitutionary atonement. I don't, I don't atonement. think so because, I, don't, because I, I think the, for me, what I use penal substitutionary atonement as a way of expressing the the truths expressed in Isaiah 53, which I think Jesus and Luke particularly of the evangelist is very self-consciously echoing as they describe mm. what Jesus did at the cross. Um, and for an outstanding full treatment of that, Tom Wright's chapter on it in mm. his Jesus book is superb. He, he just walks all the way through it. So Luke is mm. doing Isaiah 53 and making it very clear that that's what's happening. To, now that, so what I mean by penal substitutionary atonement is really I, Isaiah 53 as mediated in the New Testament and particularly Verses four to six. He was he was crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. So, and I I think penal substitutionary atonement, as I understand it, is a good way of describing that reality. Okay. But I I actually think a lot of the popular level theology that goes along with it, and in my view, a desire to put that as the central atonement model around which the mm. others must revolve. I've got. Great okay. Questions well, well let, let me just stay with Andrew then, because it's kind of nice sense, to be a bit more in agreement. There's here, a bit more of agreement here, and that is nice in a way. <laughs> but but given that, if you like. Um, okay. So why do you believe in it? Well, well <laughs> it's not about Let's me. turn on it. No, I do, so I do affirm it. Okay. I absolutely do you, you affirm it. I, I affirm a You affirm of the idea, think, but, and but, this is, again might be a clumsy way of putting it, but that, that God punished Jesus in the place of us, yes, basically. I do. I do. And I think it's often the word punishment mm. that, that is kind of the one that will we'll be like, well, what mm. do we mean by punishment and so mm. on? Um, so, so in that sense, do you have a problem with with that general concept, yeah, and, you, and see, you don't think that's represented? Yeah, he's not happy with it. He no. wants to drive away. <laughs> <laughs> you see, what actually happened was um, I wrote what I wrote, and, and you know, I was very grateful. Tom Wright really came to my aid and said he agreed with me, and I eventually wrote a whole book on this thing, um, but kept the term penal substitution. Mm -hmm. I then wrote about penal substitution. And again, it's my kind of apologetic bit playing mm. in, do you know. Um, I, I said to Tom, th through the books that we've mm. exchanged, Tom, I'll leave you to defend the term penal substitutionary atonement if you want. If you want to redeem it and bring it back from this popular 
grotesque understanding of it that's out there all the time because I agree with Andrew you know the bus story I've heard the train story there's the bridge okay. story there's all sorts of things mm. but it's always this ugly version of God you get and I, I simply said to Tom I'll leave you to redeem this term but for me I just think it's much more helpful to just abandon yeah. it okay. and, talk, and, about and talk about more about what I think the deeper okay. and stronger. Well, I won't. Of the I won't cross try up. to create a, a division where there isn't yeah. necessarily one. But it we, does, I'm sure we disagree yeah, about there, there might the, be the mechanics the of mechanics. the atonement. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't I, want to implant yeah. But I. But I don't. I think we probably agree yeah. that the the pop theology that I imagine Steve was thinking of when he wrote that. Yeah. infamous paragraph, yeah. I would actually agree is also very bad. Yeah. I, I, Do you know where I got the phrase from? Because I was also criticised. Somebody said I'd been reading at, at French feminist theologians and I'd got it from there. Well, lots of people said that. Do you know, boy, do you know, if I had time to do all of that, I'd be grateful. And if a French feminist theologian said this, it would be a good thing. But as it happened, at the time I was working in t TV, and every Friday night I used to sit in the pub just around the corner from Oasis offices and talk to all the local residents who loved it. I was on the telly and they'd ask me mm. who I'd seen this week. And uh, it was a lady sat at the pub. So can we always got onto uh, theology in the end and on to Jesus. Do you know, it's an amazing thing. If you chat with people long enough, that happens. And it was a lady who said to me, she said, well, you know, I just don't get it. She says, so you've got this angry God who tells us that what we've got to do is not let the sun go down on our anger. And it's the way that he runs the universe. And he tells us to do that, and yet he stored up his venom and wrath to take it out on his son. And I thought, Boy, that's a really good way of expressing it. She said, it's like cosmic okay. child abuse. That's, right. where, the and that's, that's where the phrase came from. Now, but you, you, you would say, <coughs> that, no, that's, I, I do that's a bad I representation very, of, of the doctrine. I, I would, and I would say that there is a, a very good way of redeeming not just the term, but also, because I, I, I think we're not naive here. I mean, Steve mm. is not just attacking the <laughs> pot level theology. He's also attacking the idea that God stores up judgment. Yeah, and, there's and, a wrathful and, God yeah. in the first place. And I and I think the Bible is very clear about that beginning to end. And obviously because Steve is saying actually there's a lot of bits of the Bible I don't I I don't I don't know what the best way of saying it is without misrepresenting yeah. you. I don't have to worry about that text because it doesn't represent who God is. Yeah. And I'm looking at the Bible saying actually I think Jesus affirmed it all. I think the apostles affirmed it well, all. Well let's let's talk and about I've got more so to do. A I, God I, of I've, wrath. I've got to include not, include not exactly the idea of the yeah, so yeah. when Nahum says the Lord is jealous and wrathful I think, yes, he is. I, there is a very meaningful sense in which that's true. And I suspect Steve says, no, he's not. Nahum was wrong. I, I don't know, but I imagine. I, I had a really interesting conversation one day with Jonathan Sachs, chief rabbi, um, some years ago, probably 10 years ago when this came out. I can't quite remember. And I, I happened to be on a stage with him. We we're both going to speak or something. And he smiled. He was such a generous man. And he said, uh, he said you know all this trouble you go into about wrath? Mm. He said... I never know. Why don't all those Christians ask a Jew what wrath actually means in Hebrew? He said, it's better translated as God's angst, because he's a lover. He loves us, and he's anxious for us. It's not venom. Mm. And I think that's where okay. there's been a huge misrepresentation. But then, back to my Christocentric worldview, uh, I think that if you look into Jesus, you see something different. So in the end, I suppose, I, what my, my view, hey, I do have a view of the cross and I think it's bigger and it's more gigantic and it's more life transforming and society transforming. But I would say that the idea that God does run the universe by a different moral code than the one mm. he teaches us. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, but you say, yeah, but as for me, I can do what I like. I just don't think okay. God's that I mean, inconsistent. When, when you say you <coughs> affirm a God who is jealous, who is wrathful, mm. are, are yeah. you meaning what most people assume you mean by no. that? Which is I, I, that, of, I, Probably not. I don't know what most people would assume that means. Uh, I understand jealousy in terms of an exclusive passion for a people that if they turn away, it causes him both enormous pain and does cause him anger. I, I, I see him as angry at sin. I think God really, yeah. really hates sin. I think he wants mm. to Do you believe God him. is wrathful at people? Is he angry with people? I think people? He, 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 yes, I do. But I think probably many, I imagine many people would re would represent that in other ways as well. I think, so I think that's a big part. Of, obviously, I'm a PhD student in Paul's. I think a mm. big part of Paul's theology about how judgment works, I think is bound up with the idea of um, 
judgment actually being given, given to, in, in accordance with faith and on the basis of faith, but also in accordance with works, and that there's an awful lot of judgment and some anger texts in Paul as well, which I think are important. And the Greek is much more clearly about, hang on, um, about, about anger there than, than perhaps what Steve just said about Jonathan Sachs. But I think also, we, I, I, we've both been, uh, it's almost like which one of us can say the word Jesus the most wins. I, I, don't, I don't want that to be the question because actually I think we both say we want Jesus at the centre. We both say we want to honour the Bible. But actually I think the Jesus of the Gospels is much more comfortable with anger uh, being directed even at people. I think some of the endings of some of the parables, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? Get out, he's going to go weeping and gnashing your teeth. The sheep, sheep and the goats. Mm. The, uh, the guy gets handed over to the jailers mm. or even mm. torturers, which is a very unpleasant yeah. phrase. But mm. Jesus, uh, the woe to you, Karazim, woe to you, Bethsaida, Sodom and Gomorrah, got it, and you'll get worse if you're not careful. That Jesus actually, I think Steve's trying to paint a, a slightly no, more no, hippie no. Jesus well, than I well, think we have. I was going to ask Steve, yeah. I mean, I think I'm, a lot of I'm what people's actually. concerned about, and, and this I might be Andrew, that, is, yeah, is that... Yeah. When you've done these things yeah. in the past, and, and we'll come on to homosexuality yeah. next week, but that effectively what, what you're doing is is trying to make God more palatable for yeah. modern sensibilities, yeah. essentially. And, and, okay. and you struggle to do that from okay. some of these biblical no, it's scriptures. It's nothing to do with being modern, and it's nothing to try <laughs> trying to rehabilitate God at all, at all. I can't out-pastor God. God is the great pastor. He is the great lover. Uh, that's what I think, well, I knew, but I learned again uh, from Jonathan Sachs. Jesus does warn about judgment. We could th th make a whole program about what Jesus meant by judgment, couldn't mm -hmm. we? And, and hell and all of this kind of thing, because we've ended up with a kind of theology of judgment and hell that's driven more by Dante and Michelangelo's painting on the end of the Sistine Chapel than we have out of any biblical text. Mm. So we read what Jesus said and then we leap on a thousand miles thinking the text actually actually affirms what we're saying. So yeah. It's I not very nice say, though, is it? Yeah. Like, weeping and gnashing teeth is obviously yeah, it's bad. Yeah. And I think it's about the here and now. <coughs> you know, I would say, you know, when, when, when the Bible, when the New Testament teaches that, you know, if you lie or cheat or steal or are immoral or sleep around, promiscuous, etc., you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I think all it's saying is, in as far as I give my life over to the pursuit of things that are outside the character of God, I will never inherit God's goodness in my life. I can't. Sin is its own punishment. You remember years ago when the AIDS virus first hit, everybody used to say, ah, well, some people said, they are God. These, these homosexuals or these people, they are, and mm. God's wiping these people mm. out. No, it's not. It's God. He's a lover, and he's saying, sin's its own punishment. Deviate from the path. If you live a life that's not like me, you're going to end up in all sorts of mess. Not because I'm coming to wipe you out with venge, or with a vengeful yeah. nature. I have anguish for you, I love you, but I know that if you live like this, the consequences are like the weeping and gnashing of teeth, and they are like the rubbish stump outside Jerusalem. It's okay. the worst thing I mean, you can it's, ever think it's, of. It, for, so for Steve, when, when those sort of passages in Scripture, and Jesus doesn't hold back very often mm. uh, about the consequences of sin, but, but for Steve, it, it's a self-fulfilling consequence. Do, do you think that there is more of a scope for saying, no, God judges people, mm. God punishes people mm. for their wrongful yeah, I mean, he, he, action. He clearly does, throughout the Bible, he clearly does. Um, and th and again, we've got another false dichotomy here, I think, that, that the idea that sin uh, is itself a form of judgment um, and that handing over, is Romans 1, it's a very clear example, is undoubtedly true. Mm. But to say that that is the sum total of everything the Bible says about judgment is also undoubtedly false. And so, and it, it, I think... I, I, I think that's a very, it's an yeah. almost impossible case to make exegetically I, unless I, we bring another hermeneutic in from yeah. somewhere. But actually, I think what I, th I assume Steve's, you know, method would, I guess, method would be, I, I think God is like this. There are lots of texts that say this happens. No, that's therefore, not those texts true. can't be. That's, that's can't be so right. unkind to what? keep saying that. I'm trying <laughs> but, to. I'm taking the Bible seriously, and that's what I find difficult from from a different end of the church. I'm an evangelical, by the way. I'm a good news bringer, I hope. But um, but that's why I find so... Un I, I'm a, the constant accusation that what I'm doing is moving away from the Bible. So I, I'm not... I'm seeking to deal with the Bible. Karl Barth mm. said, said this. He said, he said, God is love. And he said, when we say that God is angry or God is wrathful or God is judgment, but we say those things outside the context of just 
the fact that God is love. These are different ways, he said, of talking about God is, as love. When we think about anger or judgment or, or any of those things outside the context of God being love, we get lost. So in your phrase, you talked about God's judgment and punishment, mm. and you link those two things mm. together. God's judgments are good. He's the righteous judge of all the earth. Will not the righteous judge of all the earth do what is good? So I can trust myself to God's judgments because he's not some big finger whacking person who's trying to put me down. His judgment yeah, is sure. good. So punishment, punishment's a different category. Okay. Yeah. We, we are just running out of time. So just give you a final word, Andrew, and then mm. we'll, we'll wrap up. And, and Yeah, but no, because I, I think, I don't think it's quite fair to say it's unkind to describe your method as saying, I want to set up a picture of God. I, I'm, mm. I'm maybe misunderstanding, yeah. but after three sessions, this is still how yeah, it, so on, how, how it, plays, that, how it plays to me. Well, because what I, because there are, I don't have, in my view, I have mm. Jesus is central, the Bible is authoritative, truthful, and, and it's the word mind. of God. And, and, but I think for you to say it's authoritative, truthful, and the word of God, it can still have huge swathes of it, be completely false. No, 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 no. The Bible is authoritative, it's true, it's the word of God, but Jesus is the Yes. Word okay. of God. But that, I, I, I appreciate that we're, we're coming back to where we were, and, and you, <laughs> you, you're. Who knows? Maybe in program four, we'll be able to resolve this tension. <laughs> that, that is very unlikely. <laughs> but we'll see. Miracles do happen. Um, thank you both, gents. It's been good, uh, and, and in a sense, it's been quite productive. I think this this conversation in terms of of you sort of spelling out that you're not perhaps that far apart on this, but obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you do take a different view of of what it means to have a, a God who is love, but who is also wrathful in, in a meaningful sense. We, we're going to come back um, next week for for more. So thank you for joining me again today on the programme. Uh, would you like to find out more about uh, these issues? Uh, perhaps read the articles that both Andrew and Steve have produced in regard to how they believe we should read the Bible. Do go to the website of this programme. That's christianitymagazine.co.uk slash Bible debate. And you can find links to the articles. You can find these programmes as well. Thank you for joining us this week. Next time we're going to be tackling another small issue called homosexuality. So come back again same time next week. Thank you for being with me today.